2022. Always jump number one. One of the assembly points and airfields for the 101st Airborne was at Up Ottery near Exeter. The very spot where some of the first men and machines took off for the invasion of Europe. 75 years ago, I would have been standing here looking out at an airfield crammed full of C-47s and gliders. And some of the first men and machines taken off into the night for the invasion of Normandy. British and American paratroopers and glider-borne troops assembled, ready to drop from the night skies into Normandy and secure the western and eastern flanks of the invasion area. Around 10 p.m. on the night of June the 5th, the C-47s of the American, British and Canadian Airborne Divisions began loading their paratroopers and around midnight they were taking off as part of the airborne element of the Great Crusade. The price of freedom for future generations was about to be paid as hundreds of thousands answered the call to Normandy. So we loaded down with equipment. Every man had at least one uh, anti-tank mine. Around 0001 hours of June the 6th, I heard the Royal Aircraft. I got up and looked out into the sky and I noticed airplanes and gliders behind them. The hunting first, 82nd Airborne were being flown to be dropped mantle. The mighty air armada of Allied bombers, transport planes and gliders took to the air above the south coast and flew in an endless stream to Normandy. As with the Americans on the western flank, this was conducted at night and an absolute necessity to the success of the whole operation. The bridge over the canal near Caen, now called Pegasus Bridge, was the first objective taken in the early hours of D-Day. The Airborne Division are charged with securing bridges over the Divas and Orne rivers. In addition, they are to silence a massive German battery near Merville that is zeroed in on the far eastern invasion beach. In a daring maneuver, the Brits in horse gliders land mere yards from a crucial bridge over the Orne. The Germans, caught completely off guard, are quickly routed. A small cafe near the bridge is set up as a field hospital, and the troops brace themselves for a counterattack. Near Merville, things don't go as easily. We met up with one of the Brit para guys who had survived the battle. We talked over a beer at the first building to be liberated in France, the Café of Madame Gironde. Varaville, I think it was, dropping zone. But our pilots got deflected. Somebody was potting at them, I believe. So they dropped half of the fellows in the deep, in the floodwater and the remainder of us on the land beyond it, you know. It wasn't just the taking of the bridge, it was holding this area against the 15th Panzer Division. The hope was that we would have sorted it all out before the boats came in. It got a bit difficult. In another part of the Ranville graveyard, there was a small ceremony being conducted by Jewish historian and journalist Mark Garant. Mark is an ex-Israeli Special Forces soldier, here dressed in British paratrooper uniform of the time and taking part in the many drops reenacted in the area. My father's parents uh, were killed in the Holocaust. 
That's my connection with World War II. Stick around. He related the fascinating story behind the headstone. When Private Peter Claude Denby Dreyfus leapt out of his C-47 Dakota troop transport aircraft into the dark, dangerous, flak-torn night, he did not really know what awaited him at the end of his short parachute drop to the ground. Whilst to the west, at about the same time, some 13,100 American paratroopers of the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions would begin the exact same adventure. Rather unusually for a member of the parachute regiment, he was German. Like most of the men jumping on D-Day, he had no combat experience. Of all the units dropping from the sky that night, only the American 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment had already been at war as a unit. One of the missing other ranks was the German Borden Jew, Peter Claude Denby Dreyfus. He and Private Stanion had both been killed in the attack by the machine gun fire. Their bodies lying in no man's land could not be recovered for many days. The young German-Jewish paratrooper, together with his English teammate, died attempting to destroy a dangerous enemy armoured fighting vehicle that was normally impervious to the attentions of lightly armed infantry. How does one pay tribute to men such as these? Just as we were about to take our leave, I got a message from a Jeep friend of mine who was on his way to Ranville to pick us up and take us to dinner. He asked me to look up the grave of a certain Captain Robert de la Tour of the Pathfinders Regiment. Joining us for dinner would be Robert's nephew, Simon de la Tour. Simon's uncle Robert had been one of the Pathfinders on D-Day. Jumping in before the main force, 27-year-old Canadian-born Captain Robert de la Tour, far left, with his Pathfinder comrades, was photographed synchronizing their watches on June the 5th before taking off from RAF Harwell to land close to Pegasus Bridge. It became one of the most recognized images of the war. He was part of the 22nd Independent Company, which, which were the Pathfinders. They left before the main assault. Uh, their, their mission was to drop in various sections of a particular area and, and identify landing zones and drop zones. Lads and his, and his sort of a stick, as they called it, were only all about 19, 20, 21 year olds, and I think they kind of looked up, looked up to him. Well, the officer would have been the first out, the first four to basically to land in France. We still had an appointment to keep with a certain aircraft and flight crew we'd met a while ago in Tampa, Florida. But first, we had to drive 60 miles across the Normandy battlefield to the American section and meet some of her passengers. People like the Round Canopy Parachute Team, Liberty Jumpers and others from around the world whose passion is reenacting wartime parachute drops. First stop was Eco Seville. There are going to be several commemorative jumps over the next few days during the 75th anniversary. So these guys need to stay sharp, especially when jumping out of an 80 year old aircraft with nothing but string and silk to help them. And training is important. Especially on this occasion. Even if it is in an old Zeppelin hangar. Steve Ellis George and Mark Gannard talk us through what it's like to do this and why people like them risk life, limb and wallet to pursue this pastime. Stuff. Now I don't want to just put airborne stuff on, I want to actually do it. So I went off and did my round canopy uh, qualifications, did my five jumps. I do the C-47 jumps and um, there's nothing like it. It's commemoration, so it's, again it's, it's keeping this thing alive. There's, there's nothing like seeing round canopies in the sky coming out of C-47s, you know. People flock from miles around to see it, it's a, it's a special thing. You know, this is the sight and the sound of what was going on, so this is what we're trying to do. Putting the kit on and using the kit as it was supposed to be. I think what makes the difference is the history. If you talk to any of any of the blokes that are into this, they know the history and the history means a lot to them. It's not about the thrill of jumping, it's about what it means when you jump, that you're commemorating events, the events that happened here. The venerable C-47s we met in Florida and many others from the USA had made it across the Atlantic Ocean and were now engaged in reenacted parachute drops into the same landing zones that the airborne troops were given 75 years ago. 
Doug and Popeye of That's All Brother told us a little about their Atlantic crossing as we met up with them and other C-47s in Cherbourg and at Carpique Airport. We did mainly a uh, loose formation, uh, Vic uh, diamond pattern, echelon, etc. So we were always within, you know, a thousand yards of each other. This airplane came out of restoration in February of last year and uh, has been on the road ever since. This is uh, Doug Rosendahl. Wooden head, wooden <laughs> shoes, wouldn't listen. We follow the same route in the same airplanes that uh, they did 75 years ago. It in no way, shape, or form re represents what they did. We had over 50,000 hours of uh, flight experience in the cockpit. It's in no way, shape, or form did what we do simulate or expose ourselves to the risk that they did. 20 to 25 years old. I'm sure many of them didn't have a combined total of 500 hours of flight experience in the cockpit. We uh, never laid a wrench on the airplane. All volunteers. So, no, we're paying a lot of our own expenses. I didn't even total up what this is going to cost. It doesn't matter. I'm going to do it. People, spare clothes, uh, rations, ammunition, anything that you needed to carry in there for uh, what was only going to be temporary two or three days in action. First aid pouch and your uh, carbine. The airborne reenactors checked and rechecked their equipment. Some with their own quiet thoughts, some dwelling on the historical relevance of this jump. And the C 47 crews went through their startup procedures. They were getting ready to recreate part of the largest air and seaborne invasion ever mounted. 75 years to the day.